I've, I'm going to take a wee bit of a break from my scratch build musket building um, and, and I've ordered myself a Jim Kibler Woods Runner um, rifle. Uh, and I'm pretty excited. I got it unpacked or got the top unscrewed here and I'm about to look inside. And it's, I'm like a kid at Christmas time. I just, uh, the reason I, I decided to order this, um, right, now that I need an, another flintlock, but I just had to find out if it was worth all the hype. Um, uh, anyway, we're about to find out. So, what do we got inside the box? Okay, first impression is it's packed really well uh, for shipping. Um, you even put a little wooden wedge here to protect the, um, the, the tang and the barrel for shipping. Yeah, that's pretty secure. I got to get this out here somewhere in the light where I can see exactly what I've got. And there's the heart of the machine right there. It uh, looks like an extremely well made lock. Oh, and it's got a spring to it. Wow. That's going to do the trick. So everything's enclosed in this bag, apparently, that I'm going to need. Um, side plates, thimbles, nose cap, uh, the spring for the patch box. Now let's see what a CNC machine does for inletting. If, if you think about the countless hours to start with a block of wood like I've got back over my shoulder, to get to this point one has a few, few hundred hours and I just want to see what the wood to metal fit looks like. <laughs> oh that is remarkable. That, that wood to metal fit is something I could only dream of of getting that close. Um, it's, it's standing slightly proud which if one looks at traditional muskets they were built that way so that is exceptional. I, I doubt, uh, once I get the trigger in, I may find that I have to do a little bit of work on the wood, but I would say for the most part, that's just going to get bolted together. So we'll see how, how the barrel fits. So the barrel comes, comes complete with uh, the under lugs already in place and and one can see how they're grooved. So the pins that hold the wood to the barrel go through the under lug. But I can show an example of my first, this was my first build. And uh, you can see, <laughs> I just drilled a single hole. And, and the, and the uh, stock broke at this point. So in order to fix it, uh, which, which, if you think about it, they would have done as well. Uh, I put some German silver in, and I thought, well, for looks, I put two more pieces of it in this build, and it turned out pretty good, and it, and it fixed my problem. And certainly our ancestors fixed things. They didn't, they didn't throw them away. But we'll see what kind of fit. Supposedly, everything is in place here for it to just fit with no work on the inside. Um, it comes with the, um, with the uh, tang already in place, in position, so no work to do there. <laughs> I would say, I would say that's a fit like a glove. I would say <laughs> that's absolutely remarkable. So what we've got here is a 54 caliber. Uh, it's a swamp barrel, so the balance should be good. Uh, I'm just curious as to what the the pull length is going to be from the butt stock to the trigger. And that is just ideal. And the balance is absolutely perfect. Well, so far I got nothing but good to say about Jim Kibler's um, work here. Uh, I decided when I ordered this to just go with a plain piece of metal, uh, 
maple stock, and I'm pretty impressed with the amount of figure that's in this. So I would say, I think in their catalog they say you might get 20% or 25% um, curl in it, but I would say this has got 30 to 40%. So um, sliding patch box, springs should be in the bag. Um, the wood to metal fit on the pre-mounted uh, trigger guard is exceptionally good. You can see how accurate it is. This has to come off and this spur has to be filed off and, and I'll polish all that before I uh, mount it. Uh, the wood finish is pretty good. He's left a little bit of extra around the butt plate that'll get smoothed out when I get close to the finish stage. And initially I thought I would decorate this a lot with, with um, inlays and what have you. I think I'm going to keep this really simple, uh, plain, plain person's gun. might put a f bit of work on the cheek piece and I might put a simple beaver tail uh, at the end of the tang. And I think I'm just going to leave the rest just, just as it lays. And uh, when I get this done, because I've got to get at it, uh, I'm going to actually use this on my moose hunt this fall. Uh, moose and deer this fall. This will be my hunting gun. So I've decided what I'm going to do to uh, try to demonstrate how easy this is, because I haven't got quite there yet, is to keep track of my hours and see how long it takes me from opening the box to firing that first shot and sighting it in. So we'll see how that goes. Perfect. That is just absolutely remarkable that they can do that with machinery. <laughs> Again, what takes me a couple of hundred hours of handwork. Uh, don't get me wrong. <laughs> I, I do enjoy building them from scratch and it's quite satisfying to, to build your gun complete, but uh, this is going to be a very interesting project. So where I'm at now, I've um, cleaning up all the brass, and um, it's it comes pretty good. They they're cast, and uh, I don't want to make them perfect, too shiny. I want a little patina when I'm all said and done. The hardest part probably was the butt plate uh, in terms of uh, amount of elbow grease. So typically they were cast. This is a machined one, um, so it took a little bit of elbow grease, as I say, to to clean it up. But uh, that's ready to go. I fitted the, uh, the trigger this morning, basically uh, dropped right in. It needed just a little bit of filing on the back of the base and uh, I'm going to try the lock in it now and see, see if everything works and I've got the clearance I need. So ideally on, there should be some play in the trigger, it shouldn't actually make contact with the shear spring. So it should have free play there. On half cock, it should have free play. And on full cock, it should have some free play. So, so we've got that in position. And like I said, virtually no work on my part. Uh, crazy. Anyway, I've decided to today. That this is an outstanding day. And I figure Mother Nature provides a little better light than inside my blacksmith shop. So I've set up out here and I'm not sure, but I think I can probably finish this gun in a day. Uh, if not, maybe a day and a half. We'll see how it goes. So this sli sliding patch box, um, it, was, uh, it was really snug. Um, so what I've done is I've, I've um, in order to get the clearance, I filed um, the inlet in the brass, and it seems like that's just about just about perfect. So I'm going to mount the spring, make sure that's working. I'm going to mount the butt plate, and uh, I'm going to mount the barrel. I'm going to mount the lock and the side plate, and then I'm going to sand the wood. And uh, I don't think it's too awful long before I'm shooting this thing.
If I could uh, make a recommendation to anybody making guns or doing your first kit is get yourself a good set of uh, gunsmith screwdrivers. Uh, I've fixed or seen and repaired a whole lot of mangled screws from using the wrong tool. So let's see how this guy fits. So with butt plate in place, We'll see if we've got a lock on this guy. That should work. That'll work. Okay, side plate and lock. Remarkable fit. The other thing I did um, when I started this morning, I, you, I put a slight bevel, just a few degrees in the back side of all of the metal pieces. And that uh, ensures that you don't get any binding and everything lines up. And, that should work. Two screws, side plate bolts. It's another good idea to um, when you're using the pins that are holding the wood to the barrel and and your thimbles for your ramrod is to put a put a small um, point on it it less likely to uh, to split out the wood i'm going to keep repeating myself but that's a remarkable fit Okay, so at this point what I want to do is, is drive this through a little bit further, cut off my pin so that when I'm done it's flush, maybe a little recessed, and that allows me to um, do my finish work on the wood. And this wood isn't going to need much finishing. Perfect. Uh, I can't help but chuckle when I think about the countless hours to get this point on a scratch build. <laughs> Mind boggling. The last piece I'm working on is the uh, trigger guard and the spur for pouring the casting. So I've got that off. Um, just, just a thought, a handheld vise is, is an essential tool for this kind of work. It's just a uh, worth its weight in gold. <sighs> so much for my outstanding day to work with Mother Nature's light. I've started to rain on me, so I've moved under my veranda roof and uh, yeah, we'll see if we can finish this up. Uh, so to get to the point I'm at now, uh, I've got about an hour in the brass polishing, uh, probably about an hour mounting the thimbles and the lock and such and uh, yeah, we're moving along. So I'm going to mount the barrel shortly. I'll have to take out the the one screw on the side plate because that goes through the uh, to through the um, tang at the back. And uh, yeah. yeah, it just makes me smile when I think of the hours to do this by hand.
just an observation here. The um, let me just half cock this. The flash hole. It's a lightning hole. It it's in the ideal spot. It's it's absolutely perfect. And the bolster of the um, flash pan is right tight against that barrel. So that can be dangerous if you don't have that really good fit because black powder will work its way down in there. It'll build up and and you can have yourself an accident. So that's all good. So the tang bolt is going to screw into the bottom floor plate of the trigger mechanism and that holds that in place. Sweet. And so once again, <laughs> This kit does not disappoint. That um, nose cap is an absolutely perfect fit. It's an interesting uh, thing. We, we, as black powder shooters, we all hate fouling that happens inside the barrel. However, it can be used as a byproduct. Um, so if you want a patina, like right now, I'm buffing these guys right up. But I, I don't want it to look ancient, but I want it to look like it, it's a used uh, flintlock. So I'm going to take the fouling from the inside of the barrel when I clean it, and I smear it all over the brass. And, uh, and that, that gives it a really nice patina. It makes it look nice and old. Let's see if this thing sparks. Because for all intents and purposes, this is a hunting gun now. I could go use it. Uh, the next step I have is to finish the wood. And again, um, just like the rest of this kit, um, it's not going to take a lot of work. So I'll start with about 150 sandpaper. I'll work down to maybe uh, 320 or so. And then everything comes apart. Um, I have to uh, card file or file out the, the barrel and uh, put a little patine on that. I'm not quite sure I got to do that. I still have to put the two sights in, so that requires a little bit of filing for the dovetails and a ramrod to make. Uh, and this gun's ready to go. Well, let's see if it sparks. Now, if that isn't about the most shocking orange one has ever beheld, um, it's called orange toner, and as you can see by my gloves and the fact that I'm staining this versus using aquafortis and then heating a piece of iron in my blacksmith shop and passing it over, I, I ran into a phenomenal gun maker down at the Kalamazoo uh, trade show in the spring. His name's uh, James Klein. He's from Fulton, um, uh, Minnesota. And I was so impressed by the finish on his guns that I, I bought some of his, his uh, stain products. And I thought I'll give it a try on this. Now, uh, it's going to get a, a little bit better. I'm going to, on my next coat here, I'm going to use a honey brown. And then on my final coat, I'm going to use a, a golden brown, or a reddish brown, I should say. And I tried it on a piece of wood, and it actually turned out pretty good. So anyway, we're going to see. But uh, anything's going to be better than this orange. Okay, it's, it's looking better already. Uh, one of the reasons I feel comfortable stepping out of my 18th century mode is um, this isn't a scratch build musket. This is a CNC made <laughs> a gun of very high quality. Um, so I, I'm okay stepping out of 18th century for a few minutes, but that's uh, starting to come out there pretty nice. So last coat, and we'll see how this turns out. Pretty darn nice, I'd say. So when I'm finished and it's all dry, I've got to put back together the last step will be put uh, six to eight coats of hand rubbed um, oil on it and uh, off hunting.
One finished Kibler Woods Runner musket in 54 caliber. And uh, yeah, I couldn't be happy with how the, uh, the color of my stains worked out. Um, the patch box I got fit, the darn thing is just perfect. Nice positive click there. Uh, I started to patina the brass a little bit, so I got some of the, some of the shine out of it. I have patinaed the barrel, got my sights mounted, not sighted in, obviously. Um, but, but ready to go and uh, <laughs> yeah I think in total um, maybe a little over eight hours uh, start to finish which boggles the mind if you've you've done any gun building uh, so now we're going to fire it so I guess if one really started really early in the day one could go hunting with it that that evening but I got to run some balls for it I, um, uh, I'm going to try a 530 caliber mold, 10 thou patch. We'll see how that goes. I may end up having to buy some other molds. I uh, have to find out what the gun likes, what, what it likes to be fed. So, uh, yeah, got a fire going. I'm going to run some, some lead balls. That gun fits me like a glove. I'm not sure it fit everyone, but it certainly fits me. Um, I'm going to try a little trick here while I'm waiting for my coals to get ready for my melting my lead. A friend of mine, Rob Miller, down there in the States, he's a gun builder and a good one. Uh, he does this little trick where he, um, he fires the gun upside down. Now, technically, if you think about it, it shouldn't work because as the, as the flint strikes the frizzen and flips it forward, the powder falls out. But if it'll fire, fire it upside down, it's one quick lock. So we're going to see if this trick works. I've already primed it with this fine horn that Robert Wiggins scrimshawed for me and Denis Caron hand finger wove the beaded sash so this is the first time any of these items are getting used but let's see if this thing will actually shoot upside down yep <laughs> that's what you call a fast lock <sighs> kind of a shame to get this thing dirty but um it's going to see a lot of use my fire should be just about ready I find it best when you're casting balls to actually warm your mold up a little bit. Um, you tend to get good balls right off the start. Often until the, until the mold gets good and hot, you produce some pretty wonky ones. You've got to throw them back in the ladle and melt them down again and redo them. Anyway, that's the luxury of it. You can just keep doing them until you do get a good one. So right out of the get-go, we've got almost perfect uh, musket balls. So that is the advantage of uh, preheating the uh, mold before you start pouring the lead. And, and I'm impressed. Generally, um, that's a brand new mold. And a shout out to Patrick Cameron, who came down here for a turkey hunt this spring. And he knew I was going to order this, this Kibler gun. So he... He, he actually brought that down and he gifted it to me. So otherwise I wouldn't be shooting it today or I'd be waiting on an order for one. But uh, anyway, 
Let's go see how this thing shoots.